Hi everyone, uh, Stuart Lancaster here and Fergal O'Rourke with Leaders on Leaders. We are episode, if it's right the word, episode five um, <laughs> of, uh, I guess, a, a vlog um, looking at the journey of uh, myself going from a leadership position in Leinster, uh, Leinster Rugby, into uh, a head coaching job in, in France here uh, as head coach of Racing um, 92. So as we speak, um, we're in uh, April. Um, we have Oyanax this weekend. We have Toulouse next weekend. Uh, we've just been knocked out of the Champions Cup in the last 16 by Toulouse, ironically. Um, and we are six league games to go. Um, Pre-season started on the 12th of July 2023 and the season finishes on the 29th of June 2024. It is a 12-month season. Um, but we're nearing the end with six six league games to go uh, and then hopefully if we get in the top six, we're in the playoffs. So Fergal always asks great questions and I'm, we'll talk <laughs> about the last block, which has been a challenge. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoy. Uh, I, I hope, Stuart, we're getting to a point now where we can conduct our last vlog in French. But, uh, <laughs> we, 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 we might need to hold off for uh, another couple. Another couple. Well, my my like, French is poor there's, enough. There's, we... <laughs> there's lots of little words I'm throwing in, but uh, um, you know, everything is still English into translation. It, it is, I mean, I, we've talked about this before, you know, I, I've come back to the the same point it would be a huge asset for me if i could be fluent but like my capacity at the moment is is on the day job and uh but i really want to attack it in the off season so that by the time pre-season comes around um i'm a lot better than i am i'm getting better definitely but uh long way to go we, we we'll come back to that during the course of it and in particular your initial desire about how much time you're going to spend on the pitch how much time you're going to spend kind of managing and we come back to that but since we spoke last year, it's kind of been a game of two halves. Uh, and, you, you know, after we spoke the last time, uh, you beat Bath, or sorry, you were beaten by Bath uh, over in England. Uh, you know, a couple of bad bounces and a couple of refereeing decisions that were questionable. You then hammered Cardiff. Uh, and then you entered what must have been the least successful block, I suspect, of your coaching career. Uh, Not my you, coaching career, but definitely of in the last... Yeah, in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. I had some time you, in Leeds in the Premiership, but yeah, it was... You, you, well, you, you lost five in a row, and I was fortunate enough to be in uh, there for the first game against Toulouse, a great Sunday night occasion. Uh, but you lost a, a really excellent game, 2027. Uh, you lost then to Perpignan, to Montpellier at home, who really were struggling at the time, to Stad in a local derby, but they were running really hot at the moment. And then you lost to Bordeaux uh, at home again. Um. Just, I suppose, before we get into the, the squad and how they kind of react in that, how did you feel? Because, as I say, you were struggling to remember a time where you'd had such a bad run. How did it hit you personally? Yeah, no, it was tough. It was very tough. Uh, tough. It was a tough period because it was the Six Nations. So we actually became victims of our own success in that we got call-ups, particularly at halfback, to Nolan Gary and Antoine Gilbert. Uh, and um, that hurt us for sure, alongside injuries and one or two other things in key positions. So we ended up, particularly because of the lack of depth in special positions, we had a loose head prop covering hooker. We had a, a, a number nine was the fullback, really. Max Spring played at nine. Um, so we uh, we pretty much had the same group that started the season, you know, the World Cup campaign yeah. was on. Um, but they were sort of eight, eight months in at this point. Um, and obviously by losing... The Toulouse game was was a a blow because it was the last play virtually, wasn't it? You know, it was it was a yeah. very close game till till the last moment. Um, and then the Perpignan game um, was in the week before a um, a week off, and it was a classic case of away from home. Um, and I could I could sense it in the warm up. I could sense the warm up. I thought we are going to struggle here today, uh, and we did, and we were really poor. And I was, you know, frustrated, frustrated. You know, and I've. I don't often lose my temper, but, you know, there's a few times I've lost my temper and that sheer frustration with just undoing all the good work we've done. Um, yeah. So Montpellier, as you say, um, was a sort of set piece. We got dominated in the set piece. San Francisco, a close game. We beat them away from home. They beat us. Um, and then again, Bordeaux, really good team, competitive, hard place to go and win. Uh, but some really soft, soft tries, really. So... 
So you're, you're there thinking before the Toulon game, which was the one after the Bordeaux game, um, having been top of the table, we were suddenly in seventh place. Seventh, that's right. And because yeah. of the way the top 14 works, you know, um, 14th gets relegated and 13th plays in a playoff game against the top second top of the Pro de Deux. So everyone is fighting, you know, different to URC in the Premiership, everyone's fighting. And I think there was a there was a point where I looked down the table, not up the table, <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, you know, we're probably six points away from being in 12th place, 13th place here. Um, so the Toulon game was absolutely critical and we ground out a win at the end of the Six Nations. Um, and, you know, obviously we've won a, a few since then. We're back into third. But uh, for me personally, um, it's really forced me to dig deep on uh, emotional resources, my own emotions, you know, like... Uh, really uh, using a lot of energy to try and motivate, to push, to drag, to call it what you like, you know, the team into into uh, back into a winning and a confident mindset really made me think a lot about um, how I present to the players, how I critically analyse performance when I know I'm disappointed deep down, you know, with the quality. Um, and then really making me think about the coaching aspect of it, about, about how I, how can I coach this better to get a better outcome, given the fact we've lost the core of our best players, we're struggling in key positions, and we're losing confidence at the same time. Um, and probably the other the other aspect is the management of the group and the staff. You know, so how do we hold our nerve under under this like pressure, under this pressure. Um, and the selection of the team, you know, what's the best team to select, you know? So a lot of time on my own thinking things through how to address things, you know, and uh, um, before the Toulon game, you know, which was the, there was a run of five games, having lost five games, the sixth game, um, I basically came up with a theme of preparing like it was the World Cup final. And I made, basically made the players present on every Toulon player, you know, made the players take ownership because what's happening was they were, retreating back into their shells uh, under the pressure and everyone was sort of like retreating back and I was sort of like taking on more. I remember it happened to me at Leeds uh, when I was a young coach and I remember thinking to myself, I can't get stuck in that position where again, where I lean back, where everyone leans back apart from me and I just take on more. So I tried to share and spread the responsibility um, and actually the players responded very well, the coaches responded very well and we got the win and it was like, whew, you know, big, big moment. But yeah, it was tough. It was tough. It was tough. And compared to a decade ago when you had the England job, I know the media attention probably in France is just as much perhaps as in England, but is it easier 10 years on when you go through a rough patch to maintain confidence in yourself, in, in your principles, your coaching principles? You know, do you still have that rock confidence um, that you have? Yeah, I mean, I mean, no, the, the, I mean, now? No, there is a big difference between the media, the media profile of England rugby and you know being at Racing as head coach for sure. You know, England rugby is you lose one game and there's an inquest, and you lose two, then it's your job's on the line. Um, so I'm very lucky that the club at Racing were very supportive. Jackie Lawrence, the owner, you know, they're very sensible people. So there was no sense of panic from that point of view. Um, in terms of my uh, philosophy and principles. No, I, I was confident in, in what I was doing, but what I was having to do was sort of really tailor back the challenge of training to try and give them confidence by by not making training as challenging to make it you know more loaded in um, success to build confidence and self-belief again because it, it would almost like it had like fallen off the edge of a cliff and good players were just making poor decisions under pressure. So you're there thinking, how can I help them regain confidence yet still hold them to account? Um so I was confident um, in in what I was doing, but it wasn't. I wasn't seeing the outcome uh, of the hard work on the field, and that was um, made it a difficult time. You know, Nina said to me, um, "She says you enjoy it." I was going, "This is a tough job at the moment. This is tough." Like, um, you know, uh, in France, you know the. The isolation and the loneliness seems to sort of amplify then when you're in a tough time. And um, I'm looking across, you know, the water in Dublin. I'm watching Leinster, like, you know, <laughs> um, I'm watching them play games and thinking, God, you know, that looks uh, pretty simple. Um, why is it looking so hard? 
Um, but um, but no, it was it was good for me as well because it really made me like, and which is part of the reason why I've taken the job. You know, the easy thing is to sort of say comfortable, isn't it? And I've really wanted to pump the show out of the comfort zone and try and try and create a a Leinster team, a Leinster equivalent in in France. Um, and the reality is, you know, there isn't. The teams are not at the same level at the moment. You know, Leinster has quite clearly just beaten La Rochelle in the European Cup comfortably. Um, we've just lost against Toulouse in the European Cup, and that you know, that's that gives you a good idea of the gap. Um, but I do feel we're, you know, on the performance clock. We've talked. I think we've talked about this before. A team at its peak is twelve o'clock. A team on the slide is one o'clock, two o'clock. A team on the up is nine o'clock, ten o'clock. I do dem- genuinely feel we we might be eight o'clock. Um, so we've still got a fair way to go to get to twelve. But we're definitely moving towards nine. And, you know, towards the end of the season, we get... We had a training session yesterday and it was almost like the penny dropped for the first time. And I felt like, ah, now they've begun to understand the intensity I expect, the quality I expect. They can deliver on the quality under pressure. Um, but there's still a lot of inconsistency and, and you know, it won't necessarily translate into performance on Saturday. But um, I do feel it's going in the right direction. And just at a personal level, before we go back to the squad then... You know, if you're watching Netflix during a run like that, are you watching the film or is stuff still going through your head? Do you, can, can you compartmentalise, you know, what you're going through and be present for the family and, and uh, for, you know, socially? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be fair, like, there's not a huge amount of, like, social social yeah. stuff going on in, in, in France for me. You know, it tends to be, obviously, the family, you know, you speak to on the phone, Nina's, uh, Nina's been here, but obviously she she would she went back to the UK for a period as well. So, um, but yeah, I'm pretty good at like not taking work home, you know, twenty four seven. Um, I'm a lot better at holding my nerve and believing in what's go- what, what I'm doing that will will turn the corner. Um, but it still makes it an uncomfortable period of time, and and the pressure. Uh, begins to mount so it's it's on your mind when you go to sleep and it's on your mind when you wake up um as it would be with any yeah. I don't know, f- business leader if your business isn't going well or a football manager if your team isn't playing well in the premiership or whatever really so um yeah yeah it was, it, I, 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 was I was i was yeah i was okay um but like as i said to you like i wouldn't i normally be quite even tempered um, but there've been times where uh, I'd be frustrated, and I'd, I'd obviously let them see it and feel it, um, which I didn't really like to be honest doing. But actually, speaking to the French staff, they said actually that's something that French players actually um, not enjoy, but they they can get a, a, a bounce off 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 it. But like <laughs> it's a very sustainable part way of uh, leading. I don't think. Um, you know, but having got, said you, that, you go slowly insane. I think basically. But fully having said that, Stuart, I don't know if you've picked up the South African documentary yet, Chasing the Sun. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've yeah. seen the full documentary yet, but they've shown clips where Razi, uh, after the Irish game where South, South Africa lost, he really had a go at the players yeah. uh, in, in front of the cameras. Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah, which I thought was unusual. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, interestingly, about I actually watched. I've watched four of the five. I've I've yet to watch the final, um, uh, where they beat New Zealand. Um, but it is fascinating. It's fascinating watching it. Um, and obviously knowing, see, Khaleesi, you know, I'd speak to every day. So, I've obviously got his version uh, and how he felt at that time when Razi was saying to him, you yeah. know, this isn't about see Khaleesi. You know, um, I asked him how he felt at the time. How do you respond as a player? I mean, and culturally, South Africans, you know, would would generally be, and this is from Sia telling me that they're very much the uh, they very respectful of the coach and the hierarchy and the the way in which leadership uh, operates. Um, so they took it on the chin and took it to heart and wanted to prove him wrong and and demonstrate that they were committed to South Africa and helping the nation and everything else because Razi was challenging their their belief in that regard. Um, so yeah, that was it. Was it was um, fascinating, but also, you know, there's a there's a point there's a point in the documentary where um, obviously South Africa play France in the quarterfinal, and I'm watching Sia play against Cameron Walkie and Gail Fiku, who obviously are now all teammates, uh, Racing, 
and and then watching the semi final, watching Owen Farrell drop a goal, kick penalties, you know, with the rest of the team of England come within you know uh, one yeah. scrum of beating them and going to a World Cup final. And I actually said to uh, my wife Nina the other day when we were just watching it, and I said, "Geez, I said, you know, someone should do a documentary on on Racing because next year we have Owen Farrell, Gil Fiku, and C. Khaleesi in the same room, working together on a club project." to try and create a winning team. And that dynamic itself is going to be fascinating. So for me as a leader, trying to understand the way that South Africans are motivated in, in the way you describe, is completely different to the French, is completely different to the Irish, is completely different to the English. And obviously then you layer in, what, there's Fijians, Georgians, Welsh, you know, Argentinians within the Racing dressing room. So, and and... You know, I'm I'm given an emotional, either motivational talk or halftime. Come on, you know where are we? Um, uh, talk, and that has to get translated into French as well. So you've got that 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 dynamic as well. So um, yeah, it'd pick an interesting documentary. I'm sure if uh, someone was in the there, chair, there's an idea you can yeah, pitch, to <laughs> Netflix. pitch to Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> but going back then to that run, you know. Did some players, sorry, you mentioned about training there, which was interesting, where you almost made it slightly easier so they could regain confidence? Yeah, there's like, there's like, there's like a continuum within coaching where you've got um, complacency at one end and fear at the other end. So let's say complacency, confidence, um, anxiety, fear. And what you want to be hovering between is confidence and a little bit of anxiety if you're too confident yeah. you've probably got emotion yeah. in the right place if you're if you're complacent you're, you're definitely not going to win a rugby game um but if you're too anxious and you're too fearful you're not going to win either because you won't you won't you know take any risks or you won't even fully commit for fear of failure so trying to move the dial in training so we hit the right spot um but the Part of the challenge was, particularly in the Toulon week, which is the game we won, ironically, I dialed it back so, so far to a point where I thought it's virtually unopposed training we're doing here, you know, not far off. And they kept dropping the ball. They were dropping the ball and I could see that they were getting frustrated themselves and simplified the plays and, and everything else. So um, that was when you start thinking, right, we've got a problem here. But... What saved the day, really, I think, particularly in that game, was the ownership that the players took. And I, they'd taken the ownership and they'd tried to like lead as best they could in the situation. But obviously, there's a lot of inexperienced players at this point. That all the internationals away in the Six Nations and um, we're still a new team. So, so I, I basically said, um, right, tomorrow morning you're going to present on the Toulon front row. You're going to present. On, this is your topic to present on. Second row, you're going to present on this. Third uh, half. Back row, you're going to present on this. Half back, you present on this, this, this. So everyone had to go away and do like a whole load of research and stand in front of the group, which meant two things happened. One, they um, uh, they had to do the research and prepare thoroughly for too long. And two, they had to stand in front of the group and say, in order for us to win, we need to do this. Or we uh, for, our, for us to win, our scrum needs to do this. So the front row stood up and saying, you know, our front row, this is their strengths, but this is what we're going to do. And by standing in front of a group, you are then... Um, uh, given a commitment that you're going to do it. So you're not just doing the preparation, you're actually giving the commitment that you're actually going to deliver on what you've said you're going to deliver. So um, I think um, it definitely helped us prepare uh, and the players responded positively and we had a um, a really good win in the end, albeit it was tense you know, during the game. Um, we had a really good win in a sense of relief because it came at the end of the Six Nations and it came um, on um, before a week off. And, uh, you know, it made for a far, far nicer week off knowing we'd won <laughs> that game. Uh, because then we knew the cavalry to a certain extent was coming back from uh, from the Six Nations. So, and fair play to the cavalry, you know, like you no know, Langare was amazing for, for France. He came back, played against Cast, and then Gil Fiku did the same, but... The cast game itself was a story. Like you could, we had um, very difficult players to go and win, and we had four yellow cards. So at one point we were down wow. to twelve players. Um, we were winning, and then we were losing, and we and then it looked like the game was over, and then we got this 
uh, turnover, we got penalty, we kick the penalty, we're winning. And you're there thinking, yeah, oh my God, this is like super stressful. Uh, and uh, anyway, we managed to hold out and, and and win the game away from home. And that was that was uh, huge for us. It, it, but it's interesting that um, I'm thinking of both of business and sport, you know, you you dialed it back, you gave them more confidence, you you made them step up to the plate. Yeah. Whereas a less experienced coach might say, no, I'm going to flog them harder. I'm, I'm going to make them work harder. I'm going to... Almost or I'm going to take more control of myself. Yeah, yeah I, I'm. I'm going to do more, and and, and you know, but you you took the opposite approach in yeah. a sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, it was definitely back to like the period of my time as a coach. So I took over Leeds in 2006. We won in the championship, got promoted to the Premiership, and then Premiership we were we were under uh, underfunded, um, and uh, we were struggling. You know, bottom in the Premiership, losing most games. So, and that was the period I just did more and more and more. And eventually, like just burnt out. To be honest. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, there was definitely a lot of lessons learned in that period, and you know, where are we? Nearly twenty, eighteen years later, you know, seventeen years later, remembering those lessons from a young coach, you know, and uh, um, yeah, I wonder if it's applicable to business. I, I hope it is, where people have sat at home thinking, actually, yeah, you know, perhaps I could get the people around me to do more, and all I yeah. do is some tasks, and ask them to present on, I don't know, the financial planning or the budget or whatever, and uh, and then. They have a sense of responsibility and accountability too. You know, we share the load. We share the load. But there's also a sense, and I remember when COVID hit, when I was running PwC, there was also a sense of giving think people things to do in a time of crisis, yeah. so they can they can almost forget about the bigger picture and focus yeah. on that's the task they've been given. Yeah, that's a good. Point. You know, and, yeah. and, and I do, gives... I do, I definitely think that particular week, that was definitely a really positive yeah it's, it's a really good point you know positive uh outcome as well we're all worried about the outcome we want to win yeah but okay let's focus on the process because i have to deliver a presentation on toulon scrum or you know whatever yeah did did you reassess some players after the during that period did, did some players let you down did some players um, really rise to the occasion i'm always assessing and reassessing if i'm being honest um and uh uh, there was never any sense of, um, you know, splits within the camp corridor conversations. You know, um, uh, uh, obviously as a head coach, you always get the image they want you to see. But you know, I'm sensible enough to be able to work out mood in the camp. Um, and I've also, I would, you know, check in with the physios and the people who would get the truth. You know, um, <laughs> and uh, they, they, I definitely got the sense we, we we definitely stayed together. And you know, part of the challenge. In a competition like the top 14, is that there can be, or there are lots of stories in France of these these situations where you know there's been a player revolt or this group has gone over there and they've fallen out with that group. There was definitely none of that. Um, in terms of being able to deliver the basics under pressure, obviously I learned that about the players. And part of the challenge, you know, coming into a a, a team of players that have already been signed is that you, it's not like soccer. I think people perceive that. There was a there was a comment after the Toulouse game which we lost and said oh it needs a clear out, well you can't clear it. you can't you can't you know it, obviously even if there's financial resources to pay people out who, out who are in contract, that counts in the salary cap so you can't yeah. you can't just um um clear out four or five and they're not even um uh bad apples so to speak more just if they're not giving value for money. And you think he's not really technically and tactically, physically and mentally. He's not really up to where what we need to progress. But he's got another year to go. He's got another year to go. There's no, there's no, oh, we pay him off and you know we get someone else in. That doesn't happen. It's it's a it's a myth. Um. So so what you're forced to do then is to really dig down into right. I need to get this player better because he signed and he's got another two years to go. Um. I've inherited this team. Um. So I need to make sure that until we get. Players in who like an own Farrell, for example. Um, I've got to develop Tristan Tedder and Antoine Gilbert as best I can because they're they're the starting tens, and I need to develop uh, a third or fourth choice number nine um, from somewhere because the Espoirs we don't have one. Okay. Um, so so it forces you then to really think. Okay, how can I help this person get better because I need them. And the um the, the process you talked about before the too long game of of getting the team you know, to own the analysis and own the, the, the plan. Is that, it worked, so now we're going to do that every week or do you 
take well, we, did, we, did, we definitely we, we did it we did it um uh, it's probably it was interesting i got the feedback um from one of the coaches and said oh you know i thought it was really effective and said but in france i'm not really sure we're equipped to do this all the time i said <laughs> why, why not and they said oh well, it's just not in our nature you know we've no, not been brought up like that you know in 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 our rugby environment so and i get what he's saying in that like it's even I mean, the Leinster players who I've coached are like the most diligent group you're ever you're ever going to meet. Um, and you know, to do it for a whole season where you're you're asking the players to um, play in big games against tough opposition, where every game matters, big crowds, the emotional energy that goes into that on a Saturday to travel back from wherever you know seven or eight hours to come back on a bus or fly back from the south of France. Um, to have a bit of a rest on a Monday, uh, on a Sunday, and then come back in on Monday, and then start the process again. You know, it's very difficult, I think, to do that consistently. So, so we've, I'm not, I haven't changed, I'm, um, dialed it down too much, but but I've dialed it down a little bit, and I've taken a little bit back onto me and the coaches, and sort of, uh, we're riding the wave together. I think is the best way to describe it. You know, and it's more sometimes a little bit more of me. I'm. Still trying to provide the leadership direction uh, um, and the sense of bigger picture about where we're going, the improvement on the performance clock. You know, uh, we've got these games to go. We've got these players to come back. You know, the depth is improving. The quality of the training is improving. The weather's picking up. It'll suit our rugby, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so trying to obviously keep painting that future um, in the players' minds. And then, you know, calling on your Gil Fikus, your Henry Chavances, your Sia Khaleesi's, your Will Rollins too to put a little bit more in as well themselves as leaders and then the followers uh, are following along, um, you know, nicely at the moment. But, you know, we're we're third um, and, but we could lose one game and be sixth. You know what I mean? It's it's that close a league. Well, actually looking ahead to the last block of games, you have six games left, you mentioned, two at home, four away. Yeah. Two of the away games are against Oyenix, who are bottom, and um, Lyon, who are 12th. And you've got home games against Bayonne and against Paul. Uh, now, you've got to travel to Toulouse and travel to La Rochelle. <laughs> so, but you look at that block of six and you're probably thinking to yourself, I, I, I need to win four. Cause three... I, mean, I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I always go into the game thinking, right, well, we're going to win six. Um, yeah. So, that's the mindset you develop in a team like Lens. You just think, well, we're just, you know, we're going to just keep it on six. Yeah, we're just going to keep winning every game. So I'm never going to with a mindset. We're never going to, we're not going to win. So yeah, we prepared to win this game, and then hopefully, if we beat Oyenx, then we prepare to go to Toulouse and learn the lessons from the European Cup. Um, part of the challenge as well is the home games are actually away, <laughs> in that the Paris La Defense Arena is unavailable. Um, so uh, like Taylor Swift's there for one time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're in we're in uh, Auxerre, uh, so we're in yeah. about an hour and a half south of Paris. Um, so we need to build a sort of an identity with Auxerre, and you know, we're talking about how we can do that, and you know, use their stadium and everything else. So the two home games are actually not our turn. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of that occupies my mind, but the day to day stuff is still very much well. It's a combination of um, planning my next training session, planning the selection, planning all the myriad of little management tasks that are coming up about, you know, off season, pre season, next season, um, recruitment, big thing still, you know, um, so player contracts, players out of contract, um, or trying to sign players, um, to make sure we've got the right squad for next year. So alongside the, the one-to-ones that I'm trying to do with every player, you know, um, so, so yeah, it's 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 the it's the six games, you know what I mean. But it's also it's the what's the analogy? The, it's the microscope and the telescope, you know, the, yeah. the eye of the detail and the detail of what it takes to beat Oyenax. And yes, the six games, and then the next six months and the next, you know, four years or three years, however long it, you know, I'm here for. So, and the uh, you know success for you at this point i mean you know stad and toulouse are look like they've got a lock on first and second at the moment and um, you want to make the playoffs and ideally you know in third place or better if you could but you know that's that's the aim yeah. so yeah yeah so, for sure for sure and um i remember you know obviously we lost in the european cup so you know you need to sort of deal with that a big goal 
Um, you know, we were com competitive against Toulouse and they scored the last play, uh, last try in the last play, which was, you know, annoying. We were trying to run it out. And anyway, it was 24, sort of five at that point. Um, we probably could have made it closer, but, you know, the reality is we were behind Toulouse at the moment in terms of our development. Um, but so obviously with that in mind, then, so how do you discuss that with the group? And, you know, my strategy was obviously, A, to say, it's obviously disappointing about Europe, but we can recalibrate this. And I talked actually about, um, well, there's two or three teams who I could name, Munster being one recently, knocked out in Europe, went on to win the URC. Yeah. Harlan wins, I remember, in 2012, Chris Robshaw was the England captain. And the best season of his life, they lost um, against Connacht in Europe, got put into the Challenge Cup, lost in the Challenge Cup against Toulon, which then freed up some weekends, which meant they then won the Premiership for the first time and everyone forgot about the Connor loss. You know what I mean? So I'm not I'm not wishing away a Champions Cup loss, but I'm reframing it in that we can use this to our advantage because the top four, and I talked about what does it, I asked them, what does the top 14 mean, 14 mean to you? You know, the Bouclier de Brennus, what does it mean? What's the history of it? What's Racing's history in it? So, so, and then we review the game and then, but I'm trying to recalibrate to the next challenge. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's 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 constantly trying to find ways to motivate or re-motivate. But I get a sense the moment you 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 feel you've turned the momentum from that bad block, that you know the cat you, you got a win, then the cavalry came home. You won again. You won a third time. Uh, you've had a break now last weekend. You've six games left on the clock, plus hopefully the playoff games. You, you feel you've got momentum. Yeah, yeah, I feel I feel we have some momentum, but I'm what what I'm still searching for. And again, be interested if, you, if this business analogy rings in your mind. Uh, if there's a business analogy that rings in your mind, I feel like I want to see more consistent translation of what I'm saying and what we're saying as coaches and what the players are doing training into the game. Now, the top fourteen is a different animal in terms of the way it's refereed. It's a lot more haphazard, let's call it, um, in terms of the, the the way the game's played. You know, less ball in play. Um, more set piece orientated, a lot of pushing of boundaries. Um, so there's not a natural flow to the games like there is in the European Cup because of the way in which the game is refereed. So it's a hindrance for the top 14. It's something I'm trying to work on again, bigger picture wise, with the referees uh, who are going to take over the top 14 refereeing structure in France. So Matthew Reynal and Roman Poit, so trying to build relationships with them. Um, so, so. I'll reserve judgment until we play these next two games against Hoyanax and Toulouse. Um, I saw, I was pleased with the way we trained yesterday. I'm going to reinforce that in tomorrow's meeting. Um, but I need to see that translation into the game on Saturday because it's Hoyanax is do or die. This is, they've had, they've not been in Europe. This is their last game. They, if they're going to get a uh, stay in the top 14, they have to win this game. If they lose this game, they're definitely going to go down into Pro de Deux. So it's, it's the whole town of Hoyanax and everything else has been waiting for this game for two weeks and Racing are coming into town. So it's not going to be easy. Uh, and I presume down in Oyex, the CU is kind of the posh boys coming from yeah, the exactly. capital. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I think we're seeing everywhere we go. We need, even, you know, the, you know, the English media when we play Bath or you play Ulster, you know, the Galacticos. I'm like, mm, well, not won the European Cup yet. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's been one year in 10, they've won the top 14. So, there are big names in the team, but there's big names in every French team. Um, uh, but it is part of the challenge of being a racing, a racing team is that it's it's motivation for for the likes of Oyonnax for sure. And in previous podcasts we did, you talked a lot about the identity, yeah, that you were trying to build. Is that project still ongoing? Is it st is it getting deeper, more ingrained within the the squad? Yeah, I think I think I think the, you know the more I look into it, the more I think more about this idea of um, diversity, diversity within yes. the team, and it's actually the it's the it's the bonds, it's the brotherhood of the of the players that's the the strongest uh, identity. There is a move to move back to Clom, where um, Racing's original home ground was, which I yeah. think would be a strong movement as well um, for home games. So. We don't if we can't play in the Paris de France Arena, we know we're in Clom. We're not having to, you know, we're not playing in Auxerre or Le Havre or somewhere. 
Um, so, um, so yeah, I think that's growing. I think um, uh, the more leaders we have within the team, the more I feel we have a sense of team identity for sure. But again, that's a, it's an evolving part of the jigsaw, you know, developing leadership. Um, so natural leaders in there, Gail, C. Khaleesi, obviously two being examples. But, you know, when I look at Leinster now, and I was actually reflecting on this, I actually did a podcast in maybe it was 2019 about, um, I was talking about Caelan Doris, the Irish under 20 captain, and how we, I remember he made his debut against Connor and we wanted him to be, to find his feet and his voice within the senior team as quick as he could and be the Caelan Doris, the Ireland 20 captain, not like quiet and reserved in the mills. And I look at him now and he's like, he's Leinster's captain, he's an amazing world class player. And um, so there are players like Caelan Doris who are 20, 21, 20 years in the racing team, you know what I mean? So it's going to take a little bit of time to really get that, um, that growth in Nolan and Gary and, you know, the 21, 22, 23 year olds who we have um, in the way that Leinster now have them, you know, with, with Johnny going, with Easton Asiwa going, Sean O'Brien going, Rob Carney, these legends of Leinster leaving, there's now really strong leadership group in Ross Byrne, Gary Ringrose, Robbie Henshaw, Kaelin Doris, you know, the list goes on of James Ryan, you know. Um, and that doesn't happen by accident, you know, that was, at, that was you know, um, developed at Leinster um, through accelerating their leadership. Um, uh, and I feel I'm going through the same process here. So the sense of identity is interrelated to how strong the players can make it as well. And I remember at the time, a few years back, you 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 had a, a, an implicit criticism of Leinster saying, great players, but too many people following orders and not enough leaders. And how did you change that culture and how are you cha- trying to change it now to get those leaders to come forth quicker? Well, I mean, it's... I read, um, and I, I said this to the Racing players, um, in, a, in, in I was trying to think of how to explain to them what ownership looks like. And Dan Carter has written a book on leadership and he, yes. wrote, he wrote about his time at Racing. And he's written a chapter on his time and he said, when I came, it was so different from the All Blacks who, you know, bear in mind, he'd come from, you know, the All Blacks who'd won the World Cup twice. And twice, yeah. a, a Wayne Smith, uh, Steve Hansen, Graham Henry inspired player-led leadership group and he was part of that to an environment at Racing where the coach spoke, the players listened, the players walked out the room. Some some were motivated, some were slightly motivated, some were not interested really. Um, and he couldn't he couldn't get his head around it. Couldn't get his head around the difference in this culture that he'd come from, the All Blacks to 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 France. Um, anyway, during his two years, he actually came in during the World Cup and asked him what he found. He said, "Well, my biggest hopefully legacy was the fact we set up a player leadership group and." Uh, and everything else. Um, so I was speaking to the players about this, and I said, you know, the reason I ask you questions in meetings, the reason um, I uh, ask you to recall information, the reason I want your opinion, because I want to grow you as leaders. I want you to have an opinion. I don't want you to walk into my meeting without having thought about what's my position on this. I said, so you better get used to it, because if you've not worked it out, we're seven or eight months in, I'm doing every train and every time we meet, I'm going to be asking you questions and I'm expecting answers. And I'm trying to get them to really properly invest in thinking about what can make this team better rather than just being turned up and told this will make the team better by me or the, the, the other coaches. So, um, so we have, we have a, um, a brilliant conversation one Tuesday uh, and on the we have a Wednesday off and on Thursday morning, um, I have the game drivers and I say to them, so, so we had a brilliant meeting on Tuesday. You know, we talked about Dan Carter, we talked about this, that and the other. And um, the coaches spoke about what it means to play, you know, for racing and everything else. Uh, and I said, so I, without reminding them of what, what we discussed, I said, so what did we take from Tuesday's meeting? I could look at them thinking, what actually happened on Tuesday? What, <laughs> what, what meeting did we talk about? They'd done no recall of the information. They'd not reflected on Wednesday night before they came in Thursday morning. They'd not thought about... So that had already got me frustrated in the game drivers meeting. And by the time we got to the 10.30 meeting and I asked the question to the wider group and I still got blank faces, I was like, right, listen, if you guys really want to lead this team and you talk about ownership, then you need to invest time into it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and you need to 
um, by investor said, so if we are discussing topics, so we are making a game plan or whatever, you must write it down. I said, because the biggest enemy to success is forgetting. Because, because how do you, how do we grow as a group if if we're ever if we're ever making uh, having topics of conversation about um, uh, our identity or our game plan or whatever else, and within twenty four hours you can't remember it and it's it's gone it's gone from your working memory it's not embedded in your long term memory how do you embed your long term memory you write it down you recall it you read over it you read over it Wednesday night you mentally relax on Wednesday you read over it Wednesday night Thursday morning you come in you know the question I'm going to ask okay. What's what did we discuss on Tuesday? What did we learn from our defeat against Toulouse? What's our game plan for success to beat whoever or you know? Um, so I'm trying to um, create habits in them, which creates leadership behaviors, but also explain to them at the same time the theory behind it. That that's really interesting, Stuart. It's really interesting because. This is teach a man to fish stuff, you know, in that you're, you're giving them the tools and the permission to actually not just sit there listening to what you're telling them, but to actually, you know, challenge you almost in a way or, or at least input into you as to, yeah. you know, what the game plan, share the game plan. Exactly. But, but I mean, it was interesting because I, I finished this, like, everyone could sense my frustration. Everyone could sense it. And Dimitri Sarzeski, the forwards coach, as I finished my talk and I sort of, stood in front of him with an exasperated sigh. And Dimitri said, he said this in French, he said, do you understand what he's saying? He's not shouting at you. He's not shouting at you like other people have done in the past. What he's trying to do, he's trying to help you get better as leaders so we can win together. Do you understand that? And they all sort of nodded their heads and he said, right, come on, you know. So it was a, it was a, it was a like appreciated and timely intervention, you know, because... I felt I was just like, and and that sort of sense of uh, exasperation, you know, I could, I, I wouldn't say it's happened multiple times, hundreds of times, but it's happened a fair few times. And um, so I feel like I'm sort of dragging, 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 but, you know, I've got to go back to, to Leinster 2016. And, you know, we were, uh, we were, it wasn't as challenging um, because there was a higher, higher base, but, still lost in two semi-finals before we did the double the following year. Um, and there was definitely uh, room for growth um, within that team. And, you know, the team I watched against La Rochelle, the Ireland team I see play, you know, it's it's very player-led and, and and that's great to Andy Farrell, to Leo in particular, I think, for, for creating that, but also the work that's been done. Final thing, because we're getting near the end here, is you're bringing another leader over next year next season uh in another Farrell. <laughs> oh. um what lead aside his you know skill what do you what does it what would he bring to the dressing room what would he bring to the team and the squad he'll bring a lot he'll bring a lot he'll obviously you know as a player you know he's he's played for England over a hundred times you know for me um he gets um, poor press in England because they perceive he's this like kicking fly half or played the Saracens. Well, anyone who watched Saracens over the last two years in particular, you'll see how good Rubio's played and how much of a factor he was within that. And you speak to any of the players who've ever played with him, be on Lions tours or England players, there's not one person has a bad word to say about him um, in terms of what he delivers. His understanding of the game is excellent. Um, his quality as a player is obviously excellent. Um and obviously his leadership credentials are excellent also. And but this is going to be very similar to my challenge coming in. I mean, hopefully I'll help him. Um in that how does he how does he get his message across? How does he how long does he take? How long, you know, will he will he take six weeks before he starts like holding people to account? Will he um will he find it uh, will he find his feet straight away and, and lead straight away? Um, these are all top, 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 top conversations I'm really looking forward to having to having with him. Um, obviously, we've spoken quite a few times. Um, he's very much got his Saracens, you know, head on at the moment. But uh, very, very soon, you know, he'll be he'll be he'll be leaving Saracens and he'll be um, coming over here first uh, of July, you know, with preseason looming. Um, so 
with him, with Sir Khaleesi, with Gil Fiku, who does a lot of the late leadership within the French team. Um, you know, what amazing coaching challenge to try and harness those three players into a strong leadership group supported by your Henry Chavonses and your Cameron Walkies and all the other Nolan Ligares, the guys who are going to be the future leaders of the team. Um, uh, I think he'll bring, I think he'll bring a huge amount, but I think it's, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and as I've found, um, and I was speaking to Sia Khaleesi about this only the other day, you know, he's not found it easy. You know, it's a lot easier for him in South Africa where everyone loves him, adores him. And, um, you know, he's with his mates that he's grown up with um, and he misses them. And I said to him, well, listen, you know, I miss Dublin. I miss Leinster. I miss the players. I miss the coaches. I miss the people. Um, but I needed to do this to to challenge myself and to work out, you know, where my own strengths and weaknesses are. And it definitely do, has done that. It definitely has done that. You know, we talked, we started about the five games losses or all the other things we've discussed. And I think um, I think Owen will find that. And I think he'll return to Saracens, maybe as a player, maybe as a coach, you know, maybe as a player coach, who knows. Um, or he'll return and return as a coach far better for the experience um, because it'll expose him in areas and it'll make him reflect in areas. And hopefully, you know, I guess I'm... Deep down, pleased that Andy and Colleen trust me with their son's development. You know what I mean. Um, so I'll be there to sort of hopefully help and guide and steer as well. You know, we go back long enough, even though we've not really spoken since since I left England. You know, I'm sure we could pick up our relationship from when when we were together. It, it's funny you say that though, and I, I, it's a tribute to you because anything I've seen or read or heard him say about the move, he's coming to play for you. He, he's, he, you know, it's it's not about him joining the club. I I I think if you hadn't been the head coach in Racing, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I think, I think I think there's definitely hopefully there's a there's an advantage in that. Um, uh, he knows he knows roughly what it's going to look and feel like. Um, and I think you know for any player coming to France, um, particularly if you don't speak the language that well, you know, to have an, an English speaking person in the coaching team helps. Um. Uh, but I don't think it's just because I speak English. You know, I do think our relationship hopefully um, uh, goes back a while. And yeah, it just it just happened to be right place, right time, I think. And uh, but, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to the sort of the challenge of trying to can we can we create a winning team? Can we is it can we do it? Can we do it in a year, two years? Can we do it? Um, well, hopefully you can do it in the next block of six weeks. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah definitely. I mean, that'd be amazing. Then we, that final blog will be, uh, it'll be a fascinating one. So we'll book it in maybe for, I don't know, let's see. Eh? But let's 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 see how we're going towards the end. We might be, <laughs> we'll do that. Yeah, let's if if we're, if we're going well, it'll be June, it'll be June sometime. Uh, yeah, the finals 29th, and we've obviously got to get there if we if we're successful. Maybe one before and one after, and then wrap it Perfect. up. Perfect. <laughs> let's do that. Okay, okay, great to talk to you again, Stuart. Thanks. Cheers, Virgo. Cheers.